Ah, uh, good afternoon, everyone. We were having fun at Halogen. This is, yeah. This is my second visit to a Halogen event, and I tell you what, it's always extraordinary. So I hope you're all having a fantastic time. Quick question for all of you, though. Uh, if any of you had the chance to go into space, who would do it? Yeah? Cool. How many of you, if you had the chance to go to the moon, would put your hand up to do it? Yeah? What about Mars? What if you couldn't come back? There's a few. That's good. It's always nice to see a few. And it always grows. There's always a few more people who kind of go, yeah, I'd go. I'd go. I'm, I'm sick of Miss Fisher in, in year seven. Yeah, I'd go. Let's go to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> If it all goes according to plan, I am going to be living there in about 11 years' time. Uh, this is a mock vision of essentially our colony uh, that we'll hopefully be living on Mars. Things will change a little bit. Things will shift around. You can see the solar panels down the front there, all that sort of thing, all renewable energy, all very green, all very hipster. Um, it, it'll be fun. It'll be a lot of fun. Uh, and that's, that's essentially the plan. That's what we're aiming to achieve. But... We've got small steps to get there. So you don't just put four people on the surface of Mars and leave them there. That doesn't just happen overnight. We're talking about an 11-year plan before anyone launches. Launch for us will be at September 2026. It takes seven months to get there. So this is a long-term project. And the way that you do a long-term project, you do it in steps. Now, this is quite clearly not Mars. Uh, there's blue skies, uh, green plants, oxygen. Um, fun, nice little things. This is a mock colony that we'll be building probably in somewhere like Iceland or Dubai and essentially testing people out to see how they work in a mock Mars habitat. The first thing we've got to do is get the people right. You start right down at the basics. Before you worry about technology or any of that sort of stuff, you have a plan as to what you're going to do and then you get the right people on board to do it right from the start. And this is what this is all about. It's all about finding the right people, shoving them in there for three months at a time, seeing if they go crazy, see if anyone stabs anyone else. Uh, and you guys will get to watch it on TV if they do. Um, we are turning this into a reality TV show, just in case. This is Big Brother in space. It's horrifying, uh, but it's going to raise a lot of money anyway. <laughs> The next step for us beyond that, once we start getting the crews right, the selection phase for us, as was introduced before, there's 100 of us still in the running. Uh, they're going to cut that group down to roughly 24 people, and they're going to become full-time employees. Once that happens, we start that 10 years worth of training, and that all happens in September next year. A couple of years after that, we're going to be sending this little guy to Mars. Now, this is a, a probe that's modelled on NASA's 2008 Phoenix lander, uh, it will be landing somewhere about 40 to 45 degrees north of the Martian equator in an area where we think there's going to be a lot of water. As you've probably seen on the news, they've discovered recently like there's flowing water on Mars. It might be loaded with perchlorates, which is rocket fuel, uh, but you can actually filter that out and you can use the water on board. So this little guy is going to be going, landing where we want to try and land our, uh, our future colony, sampling the water. If you look really closely on the back there, you can see... Little, little arm, little scoopy thing on the back, that's for scooping up the soil, putting it into a little oven and seeing what kind of water comes out of it uh, and testing that we've got the right amount of water. You have to land in the right place. There's no point sending an entire colony and having it land in the wrong place. If we land in the right spot, this little lander then becomes our beacon. We start sending supplies. We start sending things. Essentially, the idea is to send a fully functioning colony built by robots, pushed around, laying out solar panels, all this sort of stuff completely remotely. So there's no humans on Mars. We're sending all of this equipment ahead of us and setting things up step by step, getting the small stuff right and making sure everything's ready before we start risking people. So the idea is, in early 2026, we'll have a fully functioning colony on the surface of Mars, loaded with air, with double the amount of water that we need, solar panels, everything functioning, green lights across the board. And it's only then that we load people in to a tin can and fire them off into the darkness of space for seven months. Now, I get a lot of questions about all this sort of stuff. There are about four people rattling around inside and all that sort of stuff. The one question that always comes up uh, without fail every single time is, how do you go to the toilet in space? Um, which is a really nice kid way of asking, how do you crap in space? Uh, turns out with great difficulty. 
And also turns out that we're not going to have any recycling systems on this because it's a one shot to get to Mars. Also turns out that human solid waste makes great radiation protection. So we're going to freeze it and turn it into little bricks, and I'm going to be traveling in a spacecraft covered in crap for seven months. <laughs> Winner! Uh, yeah, so we're going to lock, lock four idiots away and, uh, and fire them off into space. Now, has anyone here ever seen a rocket launch before? Yeah? Anyone seen one for real in real life? Uh, I'm hoping to see my first one in May next year. The Falcon Heavy is being launched out of uh, Cape Canaveral, and I'm hoping to be there for it. But as a few of you might have watched rocket launches and things like that, things don't always work out right. You have to get everything spot on to launch a rocket. Everything. There's so many pressures, so much power, the tiniest thing can tear it apart. Do you guys want to watch a rocket launch now? Yeah? Cool. Let's do it. So this is a Proton M. It's uh, being launched out of Kazakhstan in 2013. A little bit of a, little bit of a waver there. They're about eight kilometers away from this thing when it launches. Now that's not the direction rockets are supposed to go. That's also not what rockets are supposed to look like. Impact. Okay, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, 8,000, 9,000, 10,000. 12,013. That's how far away that thing was. <laughs> Knocked a bunch of people down. We're talking about a big rocket. Uh, when when uh, the SpaceX uh, Falcon 9s launched, so not the Falcon Heavies, but the slightly smaller Falcon 9s launch, they're eight stories high. They're just extreme. Talking, when the shuttle was launched, the space shuttle was launching, it was launching with a million kilograms of fuel. Huge, absolutely huge, and everything has to be right. Any guesses what went wrong with that? A lot, did I hear? <laughs> the end product was probably a lot. The cause was quite small. The cause was a single switch that had been installed upside down so the rocket thought it was flying up when it was actually flying down. One switch. Talk about mastering the little. Get stuff right. <laughs> Far out. Anyway. So that's the end goal. If we, everything works right, we get the little stuff right, we get people living on the surface of Mars. But once we get there, things are still pretty challenging. So we're going to be living inside that, uh, which looks like a giant white caterpillar uh, filled with despair. Um, there's, you know, it looks, it looks quite comfy. Like you've got TVs, you've got like big comfy couches, you've got some horrifying green stuff in the back there we'll talk about in a minute. Like it all looks quite comfy. Uh, and yet it would kill you in a heartbeat because it's a very small, enclosed environment and you're having to recycle all the air. Humans are disgusting. Like, we pump out carbon dioxide, we've got germs, we've got all sorts of stuff, and you're trapped inside there with it. Uh, and there's no getting out. So, probably the worst part about all of this, to be honest with you, like, it's, you know, you're trapped inside, it's not particularly pleasant, uh, you know, and, but it's not too bad. Probably the worst part is uh, not coming back home again. Um, that's part my mum's concerned about. The part I'm concerned about is having to go vegan for the rest of my life because uh, I love my bacon so much, so very much. I had a journalist ask me recently what would be the last thing I did before I left to go to Mars, if I, if I was here on Earth. And before I, I would go and get thick-cut bacon from a cafe in, in Brunswick because uh, that would be my last memory. Not seeing family, not hugging friends goodbye and that, bacon. So if any of you are interested in becoming microbiologists and working on bacon trees, you should get started now. Right now. Uh, now, <laughs> what kind of person do you think would apply for something like this? Clearly some sort of ginger leprechaun maniac. Uh, but beyond that, you know, that you had a lot of different people. We had 200,000 people apply, and they came from all sorts of different walks of life. Uh, we had doctors, we had engineers. I joke, I'm originally a physicist, God knows why, but um, bounce around and do lots of different things. People with no degrees whatsoever, people from all walks of life. We had over 200,000 people apply. Uh, this is actually an old infographic. This is updated massively. It's saying 705 candidates remain. As we said, we're down to 100, and it's an even gender split, so it's 50-50. That's deliberate, because we're going to be sending two men and two women. 
It's not about sending another 12 dudes to the moon uh, like they did in the 60s. Uh, this is about equal gender representation and all that sort of stuff because ultimately we're a species rather than one nation or anything like that. So uh, people from all sorts. The timeline on this is a little bit out of date as well. We've pushed it back a couple of years now just because of a few delays. Uh, but the landing is supposed to be April 2027. So I asked the question, what kind of people would you send to Mars? If you had the opportunity to send people to Mars, who would you send? What kind of professions? Anyone? Engineers is one, yeah. Maybe a doctor, maybe a psychologist. Who's seen The Martian? Yeah, send, send a botanist uh, with a sense of humor. Um, yeah, any guesses what I was doing uh, when I applied to become an astronaut? I got it in the intro before. I was dressing up as this guy. Uh, now, this is Keith, the anger management koala. He traveled the world, uh, traveling around, playing ukulele, and teaching people about anger management while showing a startling lack of it himself. It was essentially me screaming at people for 50 minutes. Uh, it was really therapeutic. <laughs> really? Th no idea how therapeutic. Uh, now, if you're performing for 50 minutes in something that is akin to a giant sleeping bag screaming at people, I lost about a kilo every time I did this show in sweat. Not an exaggeration, an actual measurement. Uh, it was disgusting. I'd recently burnt this suit. It was, again, amazingly therapeutic. Um, <laughs> but for me to get to that point, to be able to get to that level of endurance where you could do that for 50 minutes flat out, perform, step up to the plate, uh, I had to start with the small stuff. I had to learn discipline from a very basic level. Uh, school didn't teach it to me. University didn't teach it to me. What taught me how to get the small stuff right was running around with the army. Uh, and it's not something I recommend to any of you because it was horrifying. Uh, but this is where I learned. I had to be broken down from the, right from the top all the way down to the bottom and start again and get that small stuff right. Now, this is me at uh, boot camp in 2004. 2004, January 2004, uh, going through the final obstacle course. And it looks quite, you know, amazing, all that sort of stuff. I look at this picture, and I have a look at the top there, and I can see there's a loose strap that I haven't done up properly. I look at my hand, and I can see that my hand's not positioned properly. It should be twisted further over. It's about pulling things apart and going, actually, you're doing it well, but you can do it better. And the time that I was really tested with that, the army taught me some basics. The army sort of did it for, you know, three and a half, four years and learned a lot of different things. Where it really stepped up was when I left the Aussie army, I went and did a few different bits and pieces here and there, and then I decided to rejoin the military and step it up again. Uh, has anyone here ever heard of the Royal Marine Commandos? A few? So the Royal Marines are the British, uh, British Navy's, or the British Defence Forces, uh, Arctic warfare specialists. So they're the guys who go and run around in Norway and uh, freeze, they freeze. Short answer is they freeze. Uh, it's horrifying. Now, I decided I want to get back into the military. I decided to want to do things for real. And there's nothing that will break you quicker than discovering uh, how poorly you've got the basics down. I had an advantage over most of the guys that were there. I joined when I was 24. Most of the guys I was serving with were 18 and 19, straight out of high school. Uh, I look like I'm 12, uh, <laughs> but I was 24. Um, and they push you. They push you far further than you ever thought you could. Uh, third week of training, I had six hours sleep in seven days. And you just keep pushing. You just keep going. You keep ironing. You become half man, half ironing board because you've got to get that uniform straight. Because uh, if you stuff it up, someone gets angry. And you don't necessarily understand why ironing is so important when you've, you know, had six hours sleep in seven days. Uh, but you've got someone screaming it at you, saying that it's important. And you discover it a couple weeks later when you go out on a training exercise, uh, and you've learnt a really basic drill called wet and dry routine, where essentially you wear one pair of uniform all the time. You roll around the mud in it, it gets disgusting, all that sort of stuff. But any time you stop, you set up a tent, Strip out of all your wet clothes, and you put on nice dry clothes, and you get into your sleeping bag, and you have a sleep. The horrifying part is when you have to get out of the sleeping bag and put back on the wet clothes again, put the dry clothes into a nice little bag, pack it away, uh, and it's minus five. Um, less fun. 
Now, it's a, a fairly basic drill. It's a basic routine. It's awful. It's a really unpleasant thing to do, but it's a really simple, it's a small thing that you have to do. And the fifth week of training, uh, we had a group of guys who decided it was too hard. They decided it was one of the small things that was too hard. We had gone out on this training exercise, and they'd run us ragged for three days, and everyone was tired, everyone was cold, and the last day, these guys decided not to get changed. I'd gotten changed, I was one of the ones who did it, uh, got into a sleeping bag, and because I was one of the older guys, they looked at me as a bit of a, a, bit of a leader, um, and came and grabbed me, and went, Oz, Oz, because they all called me Oz, because they're really inventive human beings. Um, <laughs> there's something wrong with Steve. I've gone, what could possibly, no, there's something wrong with Steve, fine, get out of bed, get out of the dry clothes, put the wet clothes back on, go over, and they showed me Steve. Um, and I, I walked, I remember walking up vividly through the forest and walking up and seeing Steve, looking at the guy that had grabbed me and gone, get the training staff now. Um, it's a little bit hard to explain to people in Australia just how insidious hypothermia is. Um, it, we, took, we broke it down into three stages where for stage one was where you're shaking uncontrollably. Normally when you get cold, you can tighten up and you'll stop the shaking. Stage one hypothermia is where you can't stop the shaking anymore. Uh, stage two is where the, the blood starts to shift away from your outer limbs and it starts to pull in your core to try and keep your chest warm. And stage three is where they start to fall asleep and they don't wake back up again. And Steve was dozing off. We, we wrapped him up, uh, got him in a sleeping bag, shoved a plastic sheet under him and six of us picked him up and we ran. We were about a kilometre and a half off the main road We'd walk through the worst mud I'd seen in my life. I spent six years in the military. I've seen some bad mud. This is the worst I'd ever seen. And we ran. It had taken us 45 minutes to walk in there. We ran it in seven. And all I remember is hanging onto that sheet. And before I joined training, I'd, uh, I'd had this voice in my head. I doubt any of you have ever seen Full Metal Jacket. Uh, but it was kind of like a drill sergeant screaming at me going, Come on, Richard, pick it up! Show a spine, uh, just grinning. The voice changed that night. It wasn't, um, it wasn't angry, it wasn't bitter, it wasn't screaming at me. It just said over and over again, don't trip, don't let go. And we ran. And we got him, got him to the back of the ambulance, and I had a corporal help peel my fingers off the plastic, and we loaded him to the back of the, of the ambulance, and he drove off. And it left myself. The training staff went with Steve, um, and it left training staff gone, myself and the troop commander. And the troop commanders turned around to me and gone, right, Richards, we need to move the rest of the guys up next to the road. So we went back, picked up the 60 guys, moved them and put, and put them down in beds uh, next to the road. And then once that had, we'd sorted that out, he turned around to me and went, right, I've got to go and sort out the paperwork for all of this. You're in charge of the troop. Which is when I found two more. There's something really scary about knowing that you're it. There's no one else coming to help you. There's no radio. There's no phone. There's nothing. It's just you. It's you and these two guys. No one else was awake. No one else would get up to help. It was too cold. And all you can do is scream at them to keep them awake while they get changed. They get out of the wet clothes. So I stayed up for two hours and screamed at them. I didn't find out till the next morning, but apparently I burst a blood vessel in my nose uh, and I was covered in blood. I woke up covered in blood because I'd been screaming at him so loudly. And what kept them awake wasn't necessarily me screaming, was that they were terrified of this little ginger banshee that was just going nuts. Um, but they got through the night and Steve survived as well. Um, and all it came down to was them not doing one basic thing one really simple little thing of getting changed, of looking after the kid, of making sure that someone is okay before you leave them, before they go to sleep, leaving someone with a radio. It's all really small things. The theme of today is mastering the little. My argument is I don't think there's any big. Everything you do is little stuff. You take little steps everywhere. There's a story from World War II about uh, Russian prisoners Russian prisoners escape, uh, escaping from some of the prisons in Germany and racing through the winter and racing through the snow and the way that they did it wasn't having some large goal or anything like that. It was one step at a time. 
knowing which direction they were going and going one step at a time. So there's no big stuff, it's all little stuff. Know where you wanna go and take the small steps that you need to to get there. That's how we're gonna get to Mars. That's how we'll get all that equipment there. You make sure every rocket's right, you do your little step and get it right every step of the way. You get those capsules there, you get them connected up and you know that everything's okay. That's how we'll get the second crew there. That's how we'll get the third crew. That's how we'll keep going on and keep and put 40 people living on the surface of Mars. And hopefully by the time we've got 40 people, you guys will be the ones who are working as aerospace engineers, as scientists, as biologists, and that sort of stuff, so we can start sending 100 people at a time. And it's about laying those foundations early so that it makes it easier for you guys to follow on behind. I'll leave you with this. This is Chris Hadfield. Uh, quite a famous quote now, and uh, converted into a cartoon by a Melbourne artist uh, called Gavin Ong, who's extraordinary, uh, runs a website called zenpencils.com, which I would highly recommend to all of you. Uh, but Chris sums it up perfectly. There's so many little things that push you one way or another. You have an opportunity to go where you want to go. So don't let life kick you into the direction, into the adult you don't want to be. Take the small steps now to become the person you want to become. So thank you. Well done. Cheers. That was absolutely fantastic.